So welcome everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Professor Watts. I teach economics here. And I first uh, encountered our guest tonight, Sergei Svetnikov, oh, probably two or three years ago through his YouTube channel. It's called the Ushanka Show. And the Ushanka is the, uh, the hat, right? The kind of yes. the woolly hat when you picture, you know, Russian winter. That's what a Ushanka is. But his uh, channel is all about life in the Soviet Union because Sergei was born in the Soviet Union in Kiev in 1971. Correct. Don't mind me exposing your age. And so he spent about the first 20 plus years of his life in the Soviet Union. And then the transition when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, which was very chaotic. And then he first came to the United States in 95 to work at a youth camp in Southwest Michigan of all places. And he came back several times and he wound up staying. He uh, married a sweet young American lady and they started a family over here. So he's been in the United States for more than 20 years now. So he's got a very unique perspective about, well, two things. And actually I first invited Sergey to come speak for us two years ago, almost exactly two years ago. And you all probably remember COVID hit and it kind of destroyed everything. So here we are finally back live in person. We can do this. So I'm very um, thankful for that. I wanted Sergey to talk about uh, life in the Soviet Union, specifically with respect to how the Soviet economy worked or maybe didn't work so well compared to how the U.S. economy works and, and get his reflections on that. And he is going to talk a little bit about that. But of course, in the intervening time period, as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, events have unfolded, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm sure you've all been kind of watching in shock and horror uh, what's going on. So Sergei, having lived there, knowing Ukrainian culture, knowing Russian culture, knowing the languages, um, following Russian and Ukrainian media, has a perspective that's going to be just so much more in depth than we can get probably from any Western media outlet. So uh, he's going to offer his kind of thoughts and views on that for us as well. And I think that's going to be very, very informative. Sergey uh, wrote a book based on diaries he made when he was first in the United States. And I, as I understand, this is just volume one, right? That's good. He's going to have more, multiple volumes coming out. Well, I said, well, since uh, Sergey is kind enough to come up and speak with us, I bought the book. I said, I might as well read this. I read this in one sitting, two hours, two and a half hours. I just couldn't put it down. It was so fascinating because uh, your writing is very compelling for one. And his story is very interesting for two. It's really interesting. You know, we've lived here our whole lives. We don't have that perspective. It's just so interesting to hear someone else's perspective about what we take for granted. So I hope you really tune in and, and listen to what he has to say. It's a very interesting, very informed perspective. Sergey is not a historian. He's an electrical engineer by trade, but I find that he has a depth of understanding on history, economics, culture. So just a, just a very observant <coughs> fellow and a, a great storyteller. So. Uh, let's give a warm welcome to uh, Mr. Sergei Sputnikov. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry you guys had to spend this evening here. I hope you enjoyed and you learned something new. Uh, as the first mentioned, uh, kind of started Rushanka show about five years ago. Um, my place of work, you know, sometimes when it's slow times come and people talk and I'll sometimes will chime in and like, hey, by the way, you guys discussing cars back in Soviet Russia, blah, blah, blah. And I see the people kind of stop and listen, they were interested in my story. So I'm like, well, maybe I'll start making a YouTube channel, sharing my experiences. And Roshanka Show is right there with like 58,000 subscribers right now. And it's pretty much dedicated to mostly my experience of uh, living in USSR. And I'm almost to the point, I'm kind of doing it, I'm a nerdy guy. So I'm doing it like chronologically, so the beginning from my childhood and goes now I'm to the point of college. So childhood, kindergarten, school, uh, and then of course there's different topics there. Uh, so anyway, so if you guys are interested in that type, you're welcome to subscribe. So yeah, I was born in 1971. So yes, I'm 50 right now. Uh, and I was born what used to be called Ukrainian Soviet Social Republic. 
now it's Ukraine, an independent country. And the city I was born was called Kiev. And I know how many of you noticed uh, currently everyone in news says it's Kyiv. And I see a lot of uh, news anchors struggle. So the difference Kyiv is the Russian way you say the name of the city. Kyiv is Ukrainian way you say the city. I don't want to get a lot in the history, but long time ago, about 1500 years ago, there was a Viking family and the main character guy was named Ki. So if you say his name would be John, then the name of the city would be John's. So K, it's K's, or in Ukraine it would say Kiev's. It's Kiev's place. So that's the origin of the name. Uh, people born in 1971, 72, maybe 73, uh, were the last generation of people who had like full experience of living in the Soviet Union. So kindergarten, Detsky Sad, school, uh, Soviet schools, we had 10 years. So we went to school six times a week. So every Saturday we had to go to school. So it's another, well, my kids complaining about school and it's the, you know, I was like, hey, we went to school on Saturday. So nothing to complain there. And then of course, for 10 years, we start school at seven. So we finish 17. Then after school, you go to college or you go, it's military draft. So you go to military for two years or Navy three years and maybe you go to work. So this is like my generation with 20 years of Soviet Union. People who were born after that, they kind of cut off. So I, I didn't go to army, I went to college and my college uh, had an uh, exemption for military service and also my uh, eyes. I'm, too blind to serve, so even for the Soviet military, I was no good. For my family, so it is me, back when I was maybe like four or three years old in the kindergarten, I just kind of put the picture show you, so you have a so difference in 50 years time, right? 45 years time. So that's my family. Uh, my father, Nikolai, uh, he was born in 1946. So he's uh, your version of a Soviet baby boomer. My mother, Elena, born in 1948. Another baby boomer, they both uh, were born and grew up out in the country in the small villages. And by the time they were teenagers and in their 20s, the Soviet government got loosened up nuts a little bit. So they allowed people to move out. Before that, if you live out in the country in the villages, it was really similar to like being a serf. You had no documents, no passport. You couldn't leave your place where you live without government permission. The only way, like for guys, it's uh, joining military, of course, and getting drafted at the age of 18. So both of my parents came to Kiev, and that's where they met at some dance party at the park, and they got married in 1970. I was born in 1971. So it looks like I had a pretty happy Soviet childhood right there, smiling. I got really lucky. My uncle, uh, he was in photography, so a lot of pictures. I would never have that many photos, but my uncle was taking a lot of pictures. Okay, so here, uh, this is, uh, we are in, in the village in the northern Ukraine. So my grandmother, Maria, born 1907. My grandpa, Sergei, I was named after him, also born 1907, and my parents and me. This was taken in May, I think it's like 1976, 77. So this village was taken in northern Ukraine, as I mentioned, right now it's under occupation by Russia. Uh, my mother is there right now. She's okay, but they were all like Russians occupied on the first day of the war because it's literally like 15 kilometers from the border. Uh, there's an ancient spot, it's Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia. Border common once father's uh, like a monument for this uh, friend, uh, forever friendship between Russians, Ukraine, and Belarusian. Because right now it's not really the case. So we came every spring to help uh, grandparents to plant potatoes. So if you live in a village in the Soviet Union, you are required to work at the local collective farm. And most people weren't paid. It's pretty much, you kind of like own, so it's like a cooperative, you own with everyone, everything else, and you don't own anything. You weren't allowed to have a horse. You could have only one cow, one pig, chickens, geese, and the collective farm will provide you with, uh, a mm -hmm. couple of acres of land that you can 
plant potatoes, vegetables, apples, whatever. And that's pretty much how you survive on. Uh, collective farm was required to sell its produce to the government. Government would set up prices. Government wanted to provide cheap foodstuffs to the workers in the cities. So, of course, they will, in order to provide cheap food in the cities, you offer low prices to collective farms. Since government is monopoly, no one else will offer you anything else. Uh, most collective farms were running pretty much like a zero profit. So when you don't make any money, how do you pay your collective farm workers? Uh, you can pay them with hay. You allow them to harvest hay at the collective farm property so you can feed your cow. Because in the winter, cow needs to eat still, right? You can give them some grain. So a lot of it was just, uh, and I, I had a video on my YouTube channel. Uh, my distant relative, she was a, um, a milkmaid with milking cows and uh, look at her workbook. So every person had a workbook, a and they um, were required to work a specific amount of days a year. Like it was the law. You have to work like 200 days, no matter what. And then I was said how it was compensated and she had like so much straw she got. She got two sacks of grain. Uh, so people out in the country were extremely poor because they literally had no income. You can make some money if you sell excessive crop, if you have some potatoes or pork. Uh, so, and I said, everything was done by hand. So planting, I don't know if anybody has experience planting potatoes, harvesting potatoes by hand. So it, it's really, planting is not that hard. It's harvesting because you got to get on your knees and go through and get potatoes. My kids thought it was like, the most fun thing ever is like searching for potatoes. Like, dude, if that's a field, two acres, it gets old really quick. Um, let's see if I, okay, so here we go. So this is a nice um, tiny May day. In Soviet Union, we had like extended holiday weekend in May, because May 1st was International uh, Workers Solidarity Day, which originated from Chicago, if anyone knew about it. And then May 9, Victory Day, so usually people, so kids, my parents, will come back to the village to help grandparents to plant potatoes, and then they will share some potatoes with us. So it's me with a shower, uh, Grandma Maria holding, so that's you bring potatoes, uh, seed potatoes, and then you start planting. Uh, yeah, so everything was done by hand. My grandparents, they never had any conveniences um, outhouse, even in the 80s. No running water, used in the cellar instead of refrigerator. So they worked all their lives in a collective farm. And what they got is a retirement, like a pension. My grandma had 12 rubles, uh, which pair of winter boots would be 70 rubles. And your pension is 12 rubles. Bread was subsidized with 16, we'll call it cents or copex. Uh, so I always, for some reason, think the easiest way to compare is vodka. Like how much vodka can you buy for your salary or for your, so um, for 12 rubles, you could buy four bottles of vodka. So bottles are no or 20 bucks, probably no one drinks alcohol, right? You're underage. <laughs> uh, so for, so her pension was $80. After working all her life, uh, not getting paid. So another interesting part, uh, so living in the Soviet Union is housing. And that's a lot of people tell me how great life in the Soviet Union was because housing was free, which is not correct. It was really affordable once you get it. So this picture, uh, this is my mom giving me a bath. For first five years, when my parents got married, uh, we lived in the dorms. Uh, any of you guys live in the dorms here in Ferris? So we lived in one room, smaller room, which we shared with another family. Uh, there was a one bathroom with several stalls that was shared by the whole floor. No run, only cold water, running cold water in the kitchen or bathroom, no hot water. So my mom had to fill like a metal tub 
think you kind of see corner a little bit. Bring hot water, so she heat up at the stove in the kitchen, communal kitchen, brings to the room, and that's how I take a bath once a week. Uh, table right in the middle, this is to see the table. So our neighbors were on the left side of the room, we were on the right side of the room. So a young couple just got married, sharing room with another family. It's a lot of, I was too little to understand all that part. <laughs> but I kind of asked my dad, like, how'd you guys like take shifts? One couple goes for a walk in the park. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't want to talk about it. Like, all right. uh, in five years, um, so my parents, basically, you couldn't just go and rent because there was no private ownership of apartments or anything like that. So renting was challenging. Usually you get on the waiting list. It's not about the money. It's about, I need to get a job that I can get housing as quick as possible. At that time, um, neither my mom or my dad had like waiting lists at all available with places of work. So we kind of got stuck because she said three families changed while we lived for five years. So picture, you kind of get used to one family, right? Then they move out, they found an apartment, new family moved in. Last family, they had a little girl, baby girl. So I was about 70, it's about four years old. I barely remember, she was crying all night. So picture, sharing a room with crying baby. Um, not fun. And uh, since the room was so small, uh, when I got a little bit too big for our crib, for my crib, there was no room to put like twin size bed, or whatever, bigger bed. And so my dad had to cut the hole in the, with the grating on the crib so I can stick my leg. <laughs> so. But you know what? When, when you're small, you don't know any better. You don't know any better. You know, now I tell my kids, because everyone has their own bedroom, you know, bathroom they share. Like, I was happy. You know, I don't know. There was a lot of kids to play with. Uh, my mom said when I was like real a baby, I was like real adorable, cute kid. So I would disappear because the girls from the other rooms will take me to play with me. And then my mom runs around like, everybody see my child. <laughs> so after five years, uh, my mom basically begged. She went, she signed the paperwork, the application for improvement of my living condition because, you know, for five years we live in this uh, dorms and she managed to get a little tiny apartment. It's what you guys call studio. So it's just one tiny room. And then there's a tiny bathroom, tiny kitchen. And it was good time to have your own room, of course, but once again, you know, then you need to to get real apartment, you need to find a job that uh, has the waiting list. My dad got a job at the Antonio Aircraft Factory. I don't know if anyone follows the war, the biggest airplane in the world, Antonov 224, just got burned down in Ukraine. He worked at that factory way before they made that airplane. So they had a waiting list of 20 years. So in 20 years, my parents could move into two room apart from that one room apart. So we're out of the dorms into the little studio that they call it hotel style apart. So it doesn't matter how much money you make. Both my parents were union, labor union members. And they had to wait 20 years to get an apartment. Once you get it, housing was about 10% of your income. So it's, it's really cheap if you compare with mortgages here in America. But then you have 20 years of waiting in quite, you know, miserable conditions. And I was talking to because I was like, what kind of value can you put on 20 years of living like this, waiting for cheap housing? But in mid-1970s, Soviet government realized they don't have enough money to provide housing like this, uh, subsidized housing, we can call it. So they came up with a new program called cooperative housing, cooperative. So there you buy apartment. Like you get type of like a mortgage, uh, we call it hypoteca. Uh, so you have to pay 30% down payment. Now it sounds familiar to what you have in America, right? 
30% down. And then for the next 15 years, interest rate was, I think, low, maybe 2%, maybe 1.5%. So my parents had a choice, 20 years of waiting or buy them bullet 15,000 rubles. My parents' combined income was 300 rubles a month. So times 12, well, we got 3,600 a year. And then of course food, other stuff. So you're getting pretty much back to basics of American housing situation. So my mom, uh, she was the one that kind of pushed for it. And I'm like, let's do it. So the, in 1981, we got three room apartment, which I thought was amazing until my wife said it's not when she came to visit. But that was cool, I had my own room. So with this housing situation, yeah, it's uh and since we got we had to pay uh, we had to pay fifty rubles a month, so out of three hundred, fifty were going towards the down keep on paying for the this capital apartment, you know, the separate story was down payment. My parents didn't have that much money because that was a uh, thirty percent of fifteen thousand. What is it? Five thousand rubles? No, a little bit less, right? Um, they had to borrow from friends because banks didn't offer credits like that. So it was another different challenge. Long story, I have a story, a YouTube video about it. So in Soviet Union, housing was affordable as long as you have. It. If you had connections or even military, military people, if you're like an officer, uh, then they have a separate system going for the military people. Okay, what else would be interesting here? So, you know, I was, uh, since I started making a Shanka show, people asking questions, and a lot of young uh, people in the United States all over the world interested in the concept of socialism because it sounds really good. You know, equality for everyone, you know, there's no extreme poor, extreme rich, um, which all correct. So I was kind of analyzing because I have 20 years of life in the Soviet Union, then I have about 20 years uh, living here. General, what can I say? If you ever wonder about life in the Soviet Union, we reached the quality in the Soviet Union. There's no doubt about it. Engineer was making 150 rubles a month, and some person that works at the factory putting the bolts on was making 150 rubles a month. So this equality was achieved by kind of bringing everybody down. So it doesn't matter how genius you are. It doesn't matter what great ideas you have. You make 150 rubles a month. It just was really, we had a lot of jokes about Soviet engineers. It's just because they were poor. Like, People who did little business on the side, like uh, the richest people in the Soviet Union were taxi drivers and waitresses. And it probably sounds like total, doesn't make sense, right? People who wait tables in America are not really in the upper class. If you work in a decent restaurant, you could make top 1,000 rubles per month, engineer making 150. Taxi drivers, they could do 2,000 rubles a month. Not official income, it's kind of doing on the side. Because you don't have your own taxi, you utilize vehicle of the company which belongs to the government. But because of the shortage of cars, high demand for different services, taxi drivers could make really a lot of money. So this whole kind of society was backwards. It's jobs here is considered not cool. You know, oh, I'm waiting tables. If you say I'm waiting tables in, in Soviet Union, it's like, oh yeah, you're doing good. So, but generally this equality, we were all equally poor. And not like poor, not American style, it was comfortable. Because housing was so cheap, you don't worry about, like, the whole idea that you get kicked out of your apartment was like unheard. Like, what are you talking about? How is it possible? It's only 10% of the income. Most people like, we never bothered this. Well, my family is different because of this cooperative apartment situation, but most people, housing expense was nothing. Electricity was expensive. Uh, but generally like housing, no one worried about it. Once you get into housing, so there was a 
just you're comfortable. You're poor, but you're comfortable. There's nothing really like here in America, you know, it's, it's a struggle. Over there, there's no struggle, but you're poor. Uh, to give you some ideas uh, how backwards everything was, um, in Soviet Union, used cars were more money than brand new car. Does it make any sense? It's because if you want to buy a car, I don't know if anybody in the cars, I don't think I have any picture of the in the cars. Anyway, it's a Lada, Buzz. Really primitive car, there's nothing there. Uh, 9,000 rubles. If you're an engineer making 150 rubles a month, how many years you need to work to have enough money to buy a car? So it's super expensive. I, I kind of try to play with numbers. Okay, American engineer, Soviet engineer. 9,000 rubles for Soviet cars. So you're looking at like price points, 200K per car. So if you're like engineer in America making 75, $80,000. So you're buying like what? What, are, what can you buy for two hundred fifty thousand dollars? Lamborghini, maybe. I don't know. So this is like a little cheap car at the price of Lamborghini, and nine years of waiting. Nine years, you put your name and you wait till it's your turn to buy a car. I remember my, one day my mom came. I was in high school that time. We didn't call it high school, but that age, and she was very proud because that I put you on the waiting list for a car. So by the time you're done with college, you're going to get a job, you'll be about to get ready to be married, we'll save enough money, you can buy a car. So that was my nine-year bright future. Hey, I'll get a car in nine years. So that situation made it used cars more expensive than new cars, because used car, somebody had it for two years, maybe a person passed away, relatives don't want a car, and there's a lot of people who want a car, there's a car without weight. So you could really sell $9,000 new car for 15,000 rubles. That was actually really big black market, shadow market of people trying to find a way to get a car without waiting for nine years, turn around and sell it at a huge profit. And we didn't have dealerships, we didn't have car sales. I mean, it's just totally different world. And needless to say, I never got my car because a couple of years after that, Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, they pretty much allowed to import cars. We didn't have any import, import cars, period. Everything was just domestic cars. And then people discovered that, hey, used BMW or Mercedes or Audi is way better than brand new Lada. So Lada went from people waiting nine years to buy a car the people don't want that brand new car, rather buy Audi for $3,000 from Germany. <clears throat> so that whole thing kind of tipped over. Okay, well, see if anybody can uh, find me in this picture. So this is a kindergarten. In Soviet Union, uh, we have 0% unemployment, which is all fantastic, right? How can you achieve 0% unemployment? You make it illegal not to be unemployed. You have three months to find a different job. If you don't find a job in three months, you can be called parasite of society. If you don't have like valid excuse, you know, surgery, sickness, uh, maybe parents need being taken care of. So, Mothers, after giving birth, they had three months and then they had to go back to work because you couldn't be unemployed and the reason to stay home with your kid wasn't serious. So I went uh, to nursery, Yasri, at the age of three months. So this is a little bit, I don't know if you saw me, mom, right there. The little guy in the military Navy hat. So this is kindergarten. It was some kind of event. Uh, it was affordable, they had to pay for it. And it's pretty much all my childhood is from early age, I'm in nursery, then I'm in kindergarten. And of course they already have, unfortunately this picture got cut off, but behind that lady, blonde lady, there's a Lenin's portrait. So we had a lot of already uh, conversation about uh, 
how great we have in the Soviet Union even back in those days. All right, that's a little bit my teenage years. That's a Soviet payphone. Two topics, unlimited phone calls. You can talk for an hour, at least someone will ask you politely to leave and uh, stop talking. Yeah, this is probably around 1986. That's when Chernobyl exploded, separate story. So I want to also talk about uh, food supplies. There's another interesting topic because we had shortages all the time. And the way government handled shortages, they created different levels of supply. So for example, Moscow, capital of Soviet Union, was level one. First of all, that uh, city was supplied then maybe Leningrad, which is St. Petersburg, then Kiev, my hometown. As small a time it goes, as last stuff you get. So big rapids, if there'll be big rapids, uh, Balshir, HP, in the Soviet Union, you guys won't have much in your stores. There'll be maybe bread three times a week. You got to get in line to make sure you get some. Uh, so a lot of times people, what they did, in small towns, they travel by train. Since you don't have a car, you take a train and you go to Moscow, or in your case, you'll be going to Grand Rapids for the shopping trip to buy basic uh, groceries. And those trains got a nickname. They were called sausage trains. Sounds kind of stupid, but because that's one of the people were buying is looking for salami and you know, other type bologna sausages. So they had this joke that says, what is it? It's long, it's green, and smells like sausage. It's a sausage train coming from Moscow, because that's what people would travel. Some people would travel overnight. So living in the Soviet Union as a consumer was quite a miserable experience. Like, no one was interested in your money. You need to have a connection. You need to know somebody who will sell you, or maybe you can pay... I know somebody who can get you a fridge without waiting list. I need a couch. And you kind of work that way. So things changed quite a bit after the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991 and Ukraine became independent and we had you know, private enterprise. And one of my best experiences was coming back as I live in the United States since 1999. Uh, my mother, she decided to move back to her village when, where she grew up. And the village kind of, it's dying out, so house is really cheap, but it's like a log cabin with no conveniences. I said, no running water, just out house, some outbuildings. Uh, so I bought her that house for $2,000. You know, it's pretty cheap, but I said, no conveniences. And... Uh, when I was visiting her, she said oh, she would like to me to buy her refrigerator. Now, in Soviet Union, if you want to decide to buy a refrigerator, you need to go to the appliance store and put your name on the list. I would like to buy a refrigerator. Then every week you come back and you confirm your desire to buy a refrigerator. So even if you have money, it doesn't matter. And then maybe six months later or so, then they'll send you a card or they can like, hey, your refrigerator came. Well, it was really enjoyable to feel the power of money when I came back to Ukraine because I told my brother, like, uh, so this village is about 250 kilometers, 170 miles from Kiev. There's a small town nearby. It's like, I bet you there's appliance stores now. There. So let's go, you know, my brother had a car there. He still lives in Ukraine. We took a bus to that small town not far from this village. And I said, I'll wait for you here at the bus stop. We have no more bus service going to the village. Like, I bet you if you show the dollars, you'll find the fridge, you'll find delivery guy, and I think they will deliver us with the refrigerator in the village. And sure enough, an hour later, there's a delivery van showed up with a brand new fridge. My brother is smiling. So that power of money, power of being a consumer was so great because you guys just have it here. Everyone wants your money if you have it. Over there, it doesn't matter. So to be back in Ukraine and people want your money and they're willing to sell you and deliver same night and deliver you with it, that was amazing. So yeah, that was the, and the main challenge for the seller was to find somebody who wasn't drunk because it was Friday night. 
So he was calling his delivery friends and relatives, like, hey, cousin, did you start drinking yet? Because I have a delivery. <laughs> so that was really cool. Like, it's just, you know, it's hard to explain to you guys because usually in America, stores are full, you, you have a shortage of money, but there's plenty of goods. Back in Soviet Union, there was a shortage of goods, and somewhere there was plenty of money. Plenty, uh, my family managed to save 5,000 rubles in 20 years. So we considered making 300 rubles a month. It's a pretty big sum, but we lost it. Separate story, but uh, they froze accounts before Soviet Union collapsed. Then when they unlocked the accounts, inflation was so crazy, you could buy two loaves of bread for my parents' lifetime savings. So that was pretty ugly.